Now, the fact of the matter is, we have a very, very little information regarding the first 20, 30, even 40 years of Rasulullah Like I have mentioned before, that if you were to get together the entire 53 years of the Makkan period of Rasulullah it will be less than half to the next 10 years and the information that we have with regards to the Madani period of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the first 53 years, we have very less information. And even of those first 53, 50, 53 years, the majority of information begins after the 40 years of Rasulullah because that's the time when he became a prophet. Before 40 years, the information that we have with regard, it's a very less, very few incidents, very limited number of incidents with regards to the first 40 years of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and I mentioned some of the reasons for it uh, in, the, in, in our last halaqa that you know who is going to record all these incidents when Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is not even a prophet who is going to record all these incidents who is going to pass down all these incidents how numerous the sahaba were how few they were in number and what kind of persecutions they were facing at that time so at that time the situation was not normal and because of all of these factors combined, we have very little information with regards to Rasulullah sallallahu with regards to the first 40 years of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. However, as a Muslim, we believe, and this is something that we take consolation in, as a Muslim, we believe that everything that we need to know about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam must be preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this is not a scientific point of view. This is a theoretical point of view. And we cannot prove it scientifically. But as a Muslim, I believe in, and you should all believe in this, that anything that we know, need to know about the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa must be preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so the first and foremost thing that we know about the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after his birth is that his mother uh, sends him away to be raised in a desert. And now, I, I understand that it sounds very strange to many of us that why would a mother would send her newborn child away from the house so that he can be raised in a desert. But well, we need to understand that it was a custom of the nobility of Quraysh at that time. It was the custom of the elite of the Quraysh at that time. And they used to do it for a number of reasons. So it was a status symbol. Just like nowadays, we must, we must have a BMW car and it should be 7 Series. 7 Series is a new version or a 7 Series or whatever the latest version of it. It's a status symbol to have such kind of cars, to have such kind of houses, to have such kind of shops, to have such kind of properties, certain amount of amount, a certain amount of money we should have in our life. All of these things are status symbols, right? At that time, this was a status symbol. But at the same time, they used to do it for a number of reasons. What were these reasons? These are the only reasons that we are going to learn tonight. Inshallah, then I will finish. Because we have to go somewhere, so I will try to wrap it up in 15 minutes, in 10 to 15 minutes, inshallah. So the first and foremost reason, they wanted their child to be raised in a pure and clean environment. They would send their children away to a desert because they wanted their child to be raised in a pure and clean environment. Probably you brothers know that the infant mortality rate, especially during that phase of humanity, and I believe even until 100 years ago, the mortality, the infant mortality rate was very, very high. And one of the ways through which you can protect a child is to send him away from what we call a civilization, from what we call a congregation. You send that child away so that only one or two people are interacting with that child, i.e. only one family. So when you remove that child from that, because you, you, prob you probably know that diseases are carried by people. MashaAllah, Brother Ahmad is sitting here and he knows this better than everyone else knows this. That diseases are carried by people. When people congregate together, that's when the disease is spread, right? So one of the ways to increase the chances of that child's survival is to send him away from that kind of environment. So for the mercy of that child and to increase the chances of his living, they would send the child away to a desert, number one. Number two, they would send him away to remove, uh, you know, the plagues and the diseases of the city of Makkah from that child, number two. Number three, they would send him away because they wanted to build the stamina of that child. They wanted to build the stamina of that child. <clears throat> a very interesting point. They wanted that child to be accustomed to the hardships of a tough life. Now, according to us, Makkan life at that time, I'm not talking about today's Makkan life. Makkan life during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a very tough time, was a very tough life. It was unbelievably hard. But Makkan people are used to it, right? 
So they would send their kids to somewhere where they would find even a tougher environment. They would send their child to be raised in even a difficult, more difficult environment. Because you know, a child, it's, it's very easy for him to adapt to different circumstances. And he's, he's very easily adapt to different circumstances, unlike an adult. Unlike an adult, right? We, uh, <coughs> a child, if he's born in a very impoverished situation or scenario, or he's born in a very congested, uh, in a very congregational area, he's, he, he's born in a very poor kind of surroundings, that child will be happy and contented. He's as happy and as contented as a child who's born in a very rich and luxurious family, right? A child knows how to find happiness. He knows how to find contentment and satisfaction regardless of his circumstances. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. A child can adapt to his circumstances very, very easily. Unlike us, if we are used to a certain kind of standard of life, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us, but if we were to be diminished from that standard of life, it would be almost impossible to live in that kind of standard. Even though there are millions of people out there who want to live our standard of life, but we are still not happy with our standard of life. But children, they are very happy. In any kind of circumstance, they are very happy. So this actually shows a long-term planning of the people of Quraysh. Quraysh had a long-term plan for their children. They had a vision for their children. They would send their children in a place uh, which is a difficult place so that they would be raised in a difficult circumstances. So when they grow up and come back to Mecca, the hardships of Mecca would appear to them as a luxury because they used to live in a difficult circumstance, in a more difficult circumstance. So when they would come back to Mecca, the hardships of Mecca would appear to them as a luxury. So that was their vision. That's why they used to send their kids to a desert. So number three. Number four, another reason which is also a very interesting reason. Some ulama have mentioned that reason. Uh, that you know, growing up in a desert away from your family, uh, this will avoid uh, the pampering of the other relatives. You know, grandparents, they always spoil their kids. Anashir, grandparents always spoil the kids, always. I remember one time, my appa, my, my elder sister, she was arguing with my father. Recently I was in Pakistan, so it happened uh, at that time. So she was arguing with my father that you're spoiling my kids, you're spoiling my kids, you're spoiling my So my father said to her, that's why Allah has created me. That's the reason why Allah has created me. Parents are strict, strict, Grandparents are lenient. This is supposed to be the case. And not only the grandparents, even uncles and aunts. You know, you, you parents probably know this. It doesn't matter how tough or how strict the, the laws, you, you have the laws in your homes for your children. The moment they go to their uncle's house or aunt's <coughs> house or grandparents' house, all these laws, they go out of the window. It's the rule of thumb. They go out of the window. So in order to raise them in a more disciplined kind of environment, away from their families, they would send them to a desert. Now the final reason, for, uh, final reason which is the most uh, important reason. Some ulama of tarikh, some scholars of history, they have mentioned this reason as the most important reason for this rather strange custom from our perspective, but for their per perspective, they were quite accustomed to it. Uh, so the final and foremost reason of sending a child in a desert among certain tribes. Now we should remember that not every tribe can come into Mecca and tell the people that I will take care of your child or take the children from Mecca. Not every tribe. There were certain tribes that were known for it. And there were certain tribes that were known for their, lead, for, for, for their fluency in Arabic language. Arab people used to consider the language of the cities to be corrupted. They used to think that the language in the cities, Arabic language I'm talking about, not other language. Arabic language in the cities, it is influenced by other culture. And it happens to any other language. Every language gets influenced by culture, by other culture. It gets, what you call it in English, it gets known words. It gets known. For example, if I have to give you an example, if you read a modern uh, Arabic newspaper, you will find 30 to 40 percent words in English terminologies. They are Arabicized, but they are English terminologies. And for Pakistan, if you read any Urdu newspaper, modern Urdu newspaper, I would say 70% words. 70% words. And that's why I sometimes, even though I was born in Pakistan, I was born and bred in Urdu language is my first language. But Wallahi, I'm telling you, I find it sometimes so difficult to read the newspaper. You know why? Limited edition company. They write it in Urdu and it's an English term. They write it in Urdu, limited edition. And you're reading it and you don't understand how to read it because it's not an Urdu word. So it happens to any language. 
But the question is, where does it happen? Does it happen in villages? Among the villagers? Among the desert dwellers? No, it happens in the cities. Among the city dwellers. So the Arab of the Quraysh, and this again shows their long-term planning for their children. We don't plan anything for our children. But this shows, even though we call them Zamane Jahiliya, the people of Jahiliya, but this was their planning for their children. That's why they used to invest time in their kids. So they, would, they don't want the traders from Yemen or from all the different places of the country to come and corrupt the, the pure Arabic dialect, the pure Quraishi dialect. So what would they do? They would send their kids to these pure areas, pure tribes that are known for their pure uh, fluency in Arabic language, uh, not to be corrupted, to be speaking in pure dialect, Arabic dialect. And one of the most famous tribes uh, that was known for pure Arabic language was Banu Sa'ad. Ibn Bakr. Banu Sa'ad bin Bakr. That was the tribe that adopted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It took care of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One authentic hadith and then I finish it, inshaAllah. Uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked one time, tell us something about yourself. Tell us something about your early childhood, about yourself. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said three sentences. He said, Ana da'watu abi Ibrahim. <clears throat> wa ana bushra akhi Isa. Was tarda'atu fi bani Sa'ad ibn Bakr. These were the three sentences he mentioned. He said, I am a da'wa of Ibrahim, of my father Ibrahim. My father Ibrahim made a dua, and I am that dua manifested. We all know what dua Ibrahim made. He was building the first house of worship, and he's placing stones in its, uh, in, in its places. And as he's praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes dua to Allah. He says, Rabbana wa ba'ath, fihim rasoolam minhum yatlu alihim ayatika. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, send a prophet from amongst my progeny, yatlu alihim ayati, who will recite your verses to them, wa yuzakkihim, who will purify them, wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wal-hikmah, and who will teach them the book and the wisdom. So this was the dua of Ibrahim. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, my father Ibrahim made a dua, and I am that dua manifested. Wa ana bushra akhi Isa, and I have the good news of my brother, Isa alayhi salatu wa sallam. Just as a side note, very important to understand, write it down, keep it in your mind. I am a good news of my brother. Some people, especially some Christians, they interpreted Bushra as gospel. Because Bushra means what? In, in English it means good news. And gospel also means good news. So according to some Christians, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, their reference is in Old Testament and New Testament that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam said that I have come to preach the good news. I have come to give you the good news. So the good news is gospel. Because in Greek, gospel and good news, same. So that's what they, but according to Muslim theologians, uh, they say that the good news, that the references that we find in New Testament and Old Testament, where Isa is saying that I have to give you the good news, the good news is what Allah is telling us in the Quran. Is what Rasulullah is telling us in this hadith. Rasuli min ba'dismuhu Ahmad. This is the good news. That after me, there will be a Rasul, there will be a Rasul that will come. And that Rasul's name is, this is a good news about Muhammad Rasulullah. It's not about gospel, it's about Muhammad Rasulullah. So he said, I am a good news that my brother, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, predicted. And finally he said, was the du'atu? I was foster care. Nidha'a means uh, to be foster care. You know, to be suckled by any woman who is not your mother. That's what Nidha'a means. And I was foster care by the tribe, Banu Sa'ad bin so this is the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now finally, brother, if you can give me five minutes, I want to remind myself and all of you uh, the reason why we started this era class. Alhamdulillah, we have been doing this era class for almost a year now. And every time when I do something, I always explain to you all the reasons. For example, tonight, I could have easily told you that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent uh, to a desert, away from his family to be raised in a desert. I could just, just have told you this and would move to uh, mm -hmm. would move on to the story of Halima bin Sa'diya or Halima bin Sa'diya, uh, but I didn't. I gave you all the reasons why Prophet was sent to a desert, and the reason every time I give you all these reasons, probably for some of you it might be quite boring to know all these kinds of. As Muslims, we believe okay, Prophet was sent to a desert. That's it. That's what we only need to know. We don't want to know the reason. We believe that this was the best thing for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that's why it happened for Rasulullah. For us, it's fine. Because we are coming into the masjid and we are willing to learn about the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are in no way, shape or form 
uh, in doubt about the deen of Rasulullah or about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. About the deen of Allah and about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The reason I always explain these things to you in numbers, in reasons, and in such a detailed form, the reason why I do it is because of one ayah of the Quran. And wallahi, when I understood that ayah, I felt myself that I, I, I felt that I have a big responsibility on my shoulder. And what was that ayah is that, you know, we always give references to this ayah. Whenever we do the work of da'wah, we always give the reference of this ayah. But we don't actually understand this ayah. <coughs> and I'm not claiming that I'm the only one who understood that ayah. I understood that ayah because there was someone who explained that ayah to me. There was someone. There are our ulama, there are our scholars, our classical tradition scholars, who explain it beautifully. So what is this ayah? Qul hazi sabili. Allah is saying to Rasulullah, <coughs> this is my sabil. This is my part. Ad'u ilallah. I call people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala basiratin, with my eyes open. With my eyes open. And we, unfortunately, we never understand what basira means. With my eyes open. Alama Zamakhshiri rahmatullah alayhi, he mentioned in his book. He said, basira means something, or basira is when you have a full vision of something. Right now, according to Arabic language, we don't have basira because of this wall. I don't know what is happening behind this wall. I don't know. So I don't have a full vision. Basira means you have a full vision. Allah says, we call, we Muslims, we believers, the followers of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we call people towards Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with our eyes open. Do you know what it means? Do you know what it means? It means that we have a full understanding about why we are Muslims. Not only that we are Muslims, Alhamdulillah, we know that we are Muslims, but why are we Muslims? Why do I say La ilaha illallah? Why do I say Muhammad Rasulullah? Why do I say that the book of Allah, uh, the Quran is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I need to know all of these things for myself. I'm not talking even about other people. I need to know this for myself. Otherwise, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there are many Muslims out there. You go and meet them. And you don't even have to be in the UK to meet all these Muslims. Even if you go to Pakistan, which is a Muslim country, where we assume that everyone knows about Islam and they have a firm belief in Islam, even if you go to Pakistan, you ask the kids over there, you ask the youngsters there, and in the UK, why are you Muslims? The most obvious answers are, I'm a Muslim because my family is Muslim. I'm Muslim because I was raised in a Muslim family. But I don't know, everybody else is Muslim, so that's why I'm Muslim. That's not good enough answers. That's not good enough, good, 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 good answers to these questions. And I'm telling you, Wallahi, I've met kids here in Edinburgh. I've been serving here as an imam for five years now. And I've met a lot of kids here. I've gone to Edinburgh University, I've gone to all these universities, I've met kids over and over again, students over and over again, who have said it to me that we don't know why we are Muslims. And at least in Edinburgh, they are leaving Islam. I don't know about Glasgow, I don't know about other cities, I know about Edinburgh. At least in Edinburgh, they are leaving Islam. Because in Edinburgh, no one is going to say, that, oh, you are a murtad, astaghfirullah. No one cares. Even parents doesn't care. Even if their kids are leaving Islam. Recently, a Jamaat came from New Mexico City. I met them. So they were here. And they said to me that, Mulana, we were in New Mexico City. 38 million people live there in one city. 38 million people. And we were looking for halal restaurants. So we only found two restaurants, halal restaurants. And there was this Algerian restaurant. We went there and we started talking to this Algerian brother. And he said, I've been in New Mexico City since 1970s. And in 1970, 100,000 Jordanian Muslims moved to this city. And today there are only two masajid in New Mexico City. And Jummah is attended by only 200 to 300 people. That is it. That is it. It's gone. Why is it gone? Because they were not raised on why they are Muslim. And then they look at the society around themselves. And they say, why can't we be like them? Why do we have to stay Muslim? What's the point? I can't become like everyone else. 
Globalization is changing our world. YouTube is everywhere and you cannot stop it. Your kids and our youngsters, they are watching videos that are confusing them. You cannot, spo you cannot, spo you cannot stop them. You cannot. And until and unless we educate them on why they are Muslims, why they are Muslims, they will not be able to serve the deal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this ayah alone, there are two concepts tied together. Understand this carefully. On one hand, we need people that will serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But on the other hand, we need people who are very, very clear about why they are Muslims. Who are very, very clear. Because when you are clear about why you are Muslim, when you are 100% sure that why you are Muslim, there is no doubt that you will not serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will put every energy that you have. You will do whatever you can in your capacity to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because now you have full conviction. Now you know why you are Muslim. And Allah, brother, that's why Allah says, Adru ila Qul hazihi sabili adru ila Allah ala basira. Beautiful words. Our deen is different. Our religion, it's different. When people ask you, why do you follow Islam? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why do you do the other? We don't have the luxury to say, I don't know. My parents do this. I don't know. Maybe it's a part of my culture. We don't have that. Other religion can say, but we don't have that. Allah tells us over and over again, everything that we do in our religion has a reason. Allah is asking us again and again, Afala ta'atilun, why don't you use your aql? Use your intellect. Why don't you use your intellect? Use your aql. And until and unless we educate them, we educate ourselves about the deen of Allah, we will not be able to serve the deen. I'm telling you honestly. I'm telling you, we are sitting in the masjid, in a muhal, in an environment, we think that everyone follows Islam. Especially this is a habit that we have. This is the mentality. We assume that in a Muslim society, our next generation already knows that Islam is the truth. Who tell you? Who tell you that our generation knows that Islam is the truth? Who told you? They have to reach that conclusion for themselves. They have to get education in which they will say for themselves that yes, Islam is the religion of truth. And when youngsters, they will have a real iman, they will have a real conviction, inshallah they will change the world. They will make this world a better place. But when they don't have a real iman, when they are Muslim only because their parents are Muslim, they are coming into the masjid because their parents are dragging them into the masjid. When they are Muslim just because of that reason, they are a waste of space. They are a waste of time and they are a waste of generation. They are. فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَعُوا الصَّلَاةِ Allah says a loser generation will come, they will waste their salah. Allah never said they won't pray their salah. They will pray, أَضَعُوا salah, waste their salah. Why would they waste their salah? Because they don't even know why they are praying salah. They are just praying salah because everyone else is praying salah. That's why, brother, whenever I give you any kind of lecture, see, Jumma Khutbah is different. It's for everyone else. But this gathering that I have in front of me, mashallah, you have been coming to my lectures for years now. It's important that we increase our intellect. You go out there, I was mentioning this the other day, go and see Ayan Hirsi Ali. Type it on YouTube and see. This is a Somalian lady who used to be a very practicing Muslim in Somalia, from elite family, moved to, <coughs> moved to Holland, Netherlands, for some reason, long story short. And then she became impressed. She started reading some atheist ideologies. And she started learning about them, some professors, some people, started reading their books, became an atheist. See, I don't have any problem if some people have things against Islam, even if they were born Muslims, and then they develop this kind of ideology against Islam, I don't have any problem with them. I have problem with all of those people who acknowledge themselves as practicing Muslims, and they don't even have enough knowledge to defend the deen of Allah subhanahu wa That lady was sitting on a platform, which was a big platform in America. Three other ladies were sitting next to her. Three other ladies that were sitting next to her, next to her, is apparently they look like practicing Muslims. Who knows what? But they don't have anything to say. That lady is talking about the status of women in Islam, that a woman's testimony is half than of a man in Islam. She is talking about the shares of inheritance. She is talking about uh, child marriage. She is talking about the marriage of Rasulullah with Aisha radiallah, that they became married when she was only nine years old. They consummated, consummated their marriage when she was only nine years old. And she, she said it, if you don't believe me, go and search and find it. She said it clearly on that for platform that if you want to stop child marriages, then you have to stop believing in Islam. They said Muslims are diverse, I accept that Muslims, there are good Muslims and there are bad Muslims. 
I understand. But Islam as a religion, as a set of faith, as a doctrine, it's not compatible with the liberal community. You cannot live with it today. It's a problem. You need to war. You need to rage a war. This is the exact words. You need to rage a war against Islam, not Muslims. I don't have any problem with her. She can say whatever she wants to say. But there are not enough Muslims to answer those questions. Even there are people who are listening to her. I saw the comment section. There are Muslims listening to her and get impressed by her. And this is the only reason why is because we don't even know why we are Muslim. We don't even know. And even when we know why we are Muslim, the only thing we know about Islam is that I'm a Hanafi and I'm a Deobandi. Or I'm a Shafi or I'm a Maliki or I'm a Hamri or I'm a Salafi. And I'm better than you because I do this and I do that. Even when we know about Islam, we know about Islam to cut corners, to tell each other that we are better than each other. We are better than you. That's the only reason why we know Islam. Why we know about Islam. So the only reason why my brothers, I gave you all these reasons and I always expect you to understand them, to learn them. Because in the outside world, people will ask you questions about Rasulullah. People will ask you questions about his marriages. People will ask you questions about Aisha. People will ask questions about women's status in Islam. People will ask you questions about the dealing of Rasulullah in different circumstances with different people. How are you going to get to know about them in these classes? And if you're not understanding them academically, intellectually, rationally, convincingly, then there's no point doing this. We don't come here so that we can just nod our heads and say, Nare takbir Allahu Akbar. And say, MashaAllah, Mulana Sahib, kya baat kya diya aapki? Tarannum aapki zavardasti. It's not because of that reason. The reason we get together here is that we can increase our knowledge. We can know why we believe in Rasulullah Sahib. Why he's a perfect role model. We are living in our own ghosla. We are living in our own bubble where we think that everything is okay. But go out of your bubble and you will see what people are saying about Islam. What people are saying about Rasulullah so Don't you feel responsible? Don't you feel? I stay in the masjid. I don't go out and meet Edinburgh. You people go out and meet Edinburgh. And I'm not telling you to convert the entire dunya. I'm just telling you that if someone comes and talks to you about Islam, you should be knowledgeable enough to give him appropriate answers. Rational, intellectual, convincing answers. That's the only reason why I do these kinds of work. But Jazakumullah khair for coming. Uh, one last thing is that, Alhamdulillah, we have a Jamaat here from Blackboard. And these words, mashallah, it's a jamaat of youngsters. And the only reason they are here is that they want to utilize their time as best as they can. You know, we have our own ideas about holidays. So, you know, we go out and we do certain things. We do get together. And in Pakistan, in the month of December, the only thing that happens is marriages and weddings ceremonies. 